Yeah, we are we are live now. Hmm. Uh, thanks everyone. Already uh, eighty three people are uh, connected. Uh, thanks for waiting for us. Uh, this is uh, one second. We come to the another uh, another international webinar. Uh, it, and uh, we are very happy that uh, uh, Dr. Lena Tripathi accept our invitations and give uh, his valuable time, uh, uh, her valuable time to our uh, platform. I request Shoma to introduce uh, uh, Madam and a uh, little bit about bioengine. I already uh, give some instructions in the YouTube live chat that uh, we are giving the a link for the feedback and certification after the talk. So please don't ask between the talk and you can ask any questions related to talk. I will collect all the questions for the interactive session at the end of the live presentation. And uh, there is always, uh, as you know, that there will be a interview session uh, where we try to learn his uh, dynamic personality about and also his uh, glorious plant scientist journey. Uh, I, I personally uh, I uh, follow her for a long time uh, and uh, quite interesting about uh, her journey and uh, dominating in the International Plant Science Society. Let's uh, her, uh, Shoma, please start. I'll start uh, now. Uh, I'll start recording now and then I will start. Okay. How's my audio? Okay, good. Start. Okay. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another BioEngine webinar. BioEngine is a nonprofit organization created to promote plant research worldwide. The webinar series has been designed to build a platform from where plant scientists can present their research to the world. We hope future scientists can gain perspective and inspiration by listening to the esteemed plant researchers talk about their scientific accomplishments and their thoughts on building the future of plant sciences. We are grateful that many renowned scientists have accepted our invitation to share their research insights with us. We are also thankful to you, the viewers of our BioEngine family, for your interest in BioEngine webinars, your constant support and appreciation. We have received a huge response through the registration for today's webinar. You can register for future webinars through our website, bioengine.com and through our social media pages. You can live view all our webinars or watch a recording later on our YouTube channel. Please subscribe so that you don't miss any of our live events. After attending today's talk, you can apply for a certificate of participation via the feedback link, which will be provided after the presentation. Please type in your questions related to today's talk in the YouTube chat box for the Q&A session. The topic for today's webinar is the potential of genome editing for sustainable agriculture by Dr. Lena Tripathi. Dr. Lena Tripathi is the director of Eastern Africa Hub and leader of the biotechnology program at the International Institute of Tropical Agriculture or IITA, a member of 1CGIAR. She obtained her PhD in plant molecular biology and MSc in molecular biology and biotechnology. She worked at the University of North Carolina at Greensboro before joining IITA. She is the leading and the she's the leading transgenic and gene editing researcher at IITA. She has been involved in plant biotechnology research for more than 25 years with specific interest in crop improvement. She focuses on science to practice and linking scientific innovations to practical applications to solve food production issues worldwide. Her primary research focuses on genetically improved important staple food crops like banana, plantain, cassava, and yam to control diseases and pests. The research outputs of her group have been published in 110 articles and featured in over 280 news articles and documentary films like CNN, Earth's Frontiers, and Food Evolution. Her scientific contributions have been recognized internationally through several awards and honors such as Excellence Awards for Outstanding Scientists and Publications. She has been honored as an elected fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, or AAAS, for her contributions to agriculture. 
Dr. Tripathi and her team have established a robust genetic transformation platform at IITA Kenya to develop transgenic and gene edited products and transfer these technologies to national agricultural research systems in sub Saharan Africa. She collaborates globally with advanced labs in the United States, United Kingdom, Europe, and Australia, as well as with national partners in Africa and various regional partners. She serves as editorial board member for Plant Biotechnology Journal, Communication Biology, Frontiers in Genome Editing, Scientific Reports, and Plant Cell Reports. We are highly honored that she is here with us today on the BioEngine platform. Ma'am, we are very happy that you have joined us. Uh, the platform is all yours now. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much, first of all, for inviting me to give this webinar, but also for my kind uh, uh, detailed uh, introduction. Let me share my slides now. Yes. Uh, is in the full screen mode? Okay. Yes. So good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are, everyone. And uh, so I'm going to talk about the potential of uh, gene editing for sustainable uh, agriculture. And as you have heard in my uh, introduction that, you know, I'm based in Africa. So my most of my examples will actually come from Africa because that's where my all my research is, is based. Uh, so I work for International Institute of Tropical Agriculture. Many of you might not know what IITA is. So IITA is one of the CGIR research centers. So CGIR, there are about uh, 14 research organizations uh, uh, present globally, as you can see from this map. And IITA was founded in 1967, and its headquarter is in actually in Nigeria, uh, in Ibadan. Um, it is one of the world's lead, leading research partners in finding solutions for the farmers for hunger, malnutrition, and poverty. IITA has delivered more than 70% of the CGIR's impact in Sub-Saharan Africa because we are the only one uh, CG center whose uh, focuses or the mandate is actually sub-Saharan Africa only. Uh, and for that reason, actually, IATA received um, Africa Food Prize in, in 2018 for research leadership and innovation. Uh, uh, IATA, we are present in uh, over 30 countries in, um, um, in Africa, but we have offices and stations in about 21 uh, countries. And we operate with uh, with hubs. So we have West Africa hub, which is green here. And uh, we have East Africa hub here. Um, and we have Central Africa hub and the Southern Africa hub. And recently, actually, we started a Sahel region as well. So I lead actually this, uh, this six countries in, um, in the East Africa uh, hub. Uh, and and uh, we have over 250 international scientists uh, working on eight different crops like banana plantain, cassava, cowpea, maize, uh, soya bean, um, and, and yam. Uh, so these are just to give you some glimpse of uh, the research facilities where all my biotech research is based. So this is in, uh, in Nairobi, Kenya. So these are our labs. So you can see some pictures from inside. And, and these are the uh, the glass houses and all these facilities are the biosafety level two uh, facility and it, this facility is actually hosted by uh, Becca Ilri hub in in Nairobi. Um, so uh, as you all know that these days the major challenge in agriculture is um, how to feed the rapidly increasing uh, global population uh, which is going to be about 9.8 billion. Uh, by 2015. But when it comes to the Africa, this challenge is even uh, greater because the population increase in Africa, which you can see from this blue graph here, is actually is increasing even more. So it is predicted that you know uh, the population will be double uh, by 2100. 
And so to in order to feed this uh, growing population, uh, or I should say rapidly growing, growing population, uh, we need to increase the agriculture production by 50 to 60%. And with all uh, that means, you know, you have to increase the production of all the staple food crops uh, grown in different countries. Uh, in addition to that challenge, the another emerging challenge is also, as you know, is the climate change. And we already started seeing the negative impact of climate change, not only on the plants, but also on pathogens, which affects those plants, because with the increase in temperature, some of the pathogens actually becomes uh, uh, more pathogenic. So, you know, so they, ha they have uh, more impact uh, on on agriculture in a negative way. Uh, so if we talk about agriculture in Africa, actually more than 60% of the population in Sub-Saharan Africa are smallholder farmers. And uh, about 23% of the Sub-Saharan Africa's GDP come from agriculture. Um, it's still Africa's full agriculture potential remains untapped. Uh, Africa has the potential to actually produce two to three times more uh, cereal and grains, um, adding 20% 20, 20 more to the current output globally. Not only cereal and grains, but it can also be uh, up same applied for the other crops like root and tubers, like you know, yam, cassava, but also, also banana and, and other, other staple crops grown in, in Africa. And uh, so when we talk about uh, uh, sustainable agriculture, actually, there is a critical need to close the yield gap uh, in the staple uh, uh, crops. And you might be wondering from where this yield gap is uh, coming about. So if everything is in its best scenario, so that means you have all the tools you want, you have very good soil, everything, then in that case, that's the potential uh, production. Uh, but that's not always the case, right? Because uh, you have some limiting factor like maybe water or the soil nutrients. So in that case, the attainable production is here. But in order to that, there are other, other challenges like you know diseases and pests, there are some weeds, and with that, the actual production comes here. So the yield gap is actually the gap between the actual production and the potential. So this is the yield gap I'm talking about. But it doesn't even stop here because there are even further um, uh, reduction in, in the produce through the post-harvest losses. In many crops, actually, they, the post-harvest losses are also huge. So, so in order to actually close this yield gap, uh, we need to utilize a full potential of all the uh, breeding tools or all the tools available in our toolbox. So, you know, we have the conventional tools. In addition to that, we have the new tools coming up. So, you know, you have to complement uh, the conventional tools with the new breeding tools like gene editing in order to get um, or, or like gene editing, like digital agriculture, uh, even the uh, genetic modification, all those tools, you have to use them in order to get the sustainable agriculture. So what I was trying to say that with increasing demand for food and limiting resources, we need better and more efficient ways to produce food using all the tools available um, uh, for the breeding innovation, such as the transgenic and the gene editing. Um, genetic modification, you know, like the GM crops have been there for several decades now. And we have seen already the, the benefits of those uh, uh, crops uh, for food security, sustainability, and even for the climate change solution. Uh, so there are several crops like, you know, soya bean, maize, cotton, canola, uh, where these uh, GM crops are like widely um, uh, cultivated as well. If we talk about um, Africa, actually the cotton, the maize the, uh, is there, but recently actually the BT cowpea was released uh, in Nigeria. That was a really success story. Uh, and if we talk about Asia, then, you know, the BT egg plant, um, golden rice, these are some of the uh, latest products which which have really very good uh, success. So currently there are uh, more than 29 countries uh, uh, planting uh, GM crops. 
uh, based on the data from 2019. And when if we talk about Africa, actually these crops have been, uh, these countries have been uh, doubled uh, uh, because like now there are more countries uh, uh, growing uh, the GM crop because in the past it used to be only South um, Africa, uh, but then there are now more like Nigeria, Kenya, Malawi, Ethiopia, Sudan, they are all growing uh, the GM crop. So um, as I was saying, the, we all know the contribution of the GM crop uh, to the food security, sustainability, and the climate change. Um, it has shown the increased uh, crop productivity, uh, which has actually accounted for about, uh, uh, about 225 US dollars uh, billion. Uh, and then the conserve the biodiversity, also provide a better environment by reducing use of uh, pesticides, um, uh, and reduce the carbon dioxide e emission, also help uh, elevate the poverty and hunger of about 17 million uh, farmers. Now moving to the gene editing. So uh, plant gene editing has become an important molecular tool uh, into the uh, molecular breeding of, of crop. So what is gene editing? Actually, gene editing is a group of technologies which are used by scientists to precisely and efficiently uh, make specific changes in the DNA uh, of a cell or, or the, the plant uh, genome. Uh, it can be used to make a small addition or deletion or actually alter the uh, like replacement, like alter little bit, a small changes in the genome. So in a layman language, if I'll say, I'll say gene editing is actually very similar to the editing of um, any uh, manuscript, you know, the way you add it. So it's the similar thing you can play or tweak a, a little bit at the plant genome. Uh, for the traits of the interest. So uh, there are uh, different technologies which can be used for gene editing, like, like mega nucleases, zinc finger nucleases, talents, and more recent is the CRISPR uh, Cas9. And what these, these enzymes are called site directed nucleases because they are very specific uh, to the sites. And what these enzymes do is they make uh, double strand cut into the, into the DNA. And after that, the, the cell's own DNA machinery actually do the repair. Because you know, when the cut is made, it cannot be remained as that one. Uh, that's how the cells have uh, their own uh, machinery. So uh, the repair can happen either in a non-homologous and joining. And during that repair, the, there can be a small uh, mutations like you know a small deletion or or like few base pair insertion or the replacement or the second way is like when the donor template is is present in that case is a homology directed repair and that can uh, lead uh, to the replacement of the whole gene or the insertion of the gene as well um gene editing for crop improvement is not new Nature has been editing the genome for a very long time, creating variations. So in the past, you know, when the variations were created, then the farmers do the selection and that's how the whole domestication happened. Uh, but in 20th century, the mutations were accelerated um, using chemicals and radiation. So, you know, radiation discovery was in 1895 and the first radiation induced mutation in plant was reported in, in 1927. And after that, it was chemical induced mutation in 1944. Uh, but all those mutations were still random. Later on, the technologies were developed for more precise gene targeted mutations. So the mega nucleases came in and the zinc finger nucleases and after that talents. And more recently, as I said, the CRISPR in 2013, the CRISPR Cas9 editing in plants were first reported, and but but it has not stopped there. You know this technology is really changing very fast. So now after that there was base editing in 2016, and then the uh, CRISPR activation uh, in in 2018, and more recently is the prime editing which was reported in in 2019. So you know and and many more. 
uh, newer versions of CRISPR and other things are uh, in uh, development right now. Um, so among all different techniques I mentioned, like you know, zinc finger nucleases, mega nucleases, talents, CRISPR-Cas9 has become actually a uh, very popular technology. And um, actually, I will say right now is that's the most popular technology in the uh, in the plant uh, engineering. Um, and, and it has been successfully applied in several crops, actually in more than 40 crops it has been reported. Um, because it is comparatively simple and easy to, um, to adapt uh, and... Uh, uh, so, so you know, once you know your target, what you want to add it, and then you create the double stranded stra uh, uh, break, and then after that, you know, you you get the the mutations. Uh, so basically, the CRISPR Cas9 technology, um, uh, the, this system has uh, two components. One is the guide RNA. So the guide RNA is like uh, a small twenty nucleotide. Uh, uh, um, basis like is it is very similar to the way you know when you do the PCR and you have uh, the primers so it's very similar but then this guide RNA has the very important role because it, it actually guides um, uh, the place where the cut cut will will happen and this is actually uh, joined with the scaffold um, and then the second component is the is the Cas9 and Cas9 is a protein. Uh, CRISPR associated endonuclease and this one acts as a molecular scissor because that's the Cas9 is the one which cut. Um, and then the guide RNA actually are very unique because they are actually uh, just adjacent to this uh, PAM, which is protospacer adjacent motif. Um, these are the three base uh, um, bases, like, you know, three nucleotides, uh, like NGGs, and then the the guides are like next to it. So that's why it is very specific, uh, uh, like, you know, very targeted. And, and then once this binds with this PAM, and then, you know, that's when the Cas9 knows uh, where, where it can uh, uh, cut. And as I explained before, you know, once the cut has happened, repair can happen in two different ways, the non-homologous and joining or homology directed uh, repair. And based on, you know, uh, what type of uh, editing has happened, you know that the, there are three different types of um, editing. So uh, as I mentioned, these, these enzymes are called site-directed nucleases. So that is in short is STN. And so the editing can be three different types. And it's very important to you to understand if you're doing gene editing, what type of product uh, you will uh, uh, achieve because it has implication on the regulatory uh, approaches. So once the cut has happened and if there is no donor template present, then in that case, uh, uh, the cell will go through the uh, non-homologous uh, and joining. And this will normally lead to uh, a targeted uh, small indels, very uh, um, like, you know, only few base pair changes there. And this normally leads to the gene silencing or the gene knockout, and it is called SDN1. But if the donor template is present, it, it can be uh, uh, for two reasons. One is that, you know, you just uh, wanted to copy the small correction and not the full gene insertion. And in that case, it is called SDN2. And the third type is the SDN3, in which case there is a full either allele replacement or full gene um, uh, insertion. So this is basically used when you want um, actually very much targeted insertion of any, any gene or gene genetic element. That's when it is. So SDN1 and SDN2, are very similar to the mutations, which can also be obtained through chemical mutagenesis, irradiation, or the spontaneous natural mut mutations. So that's why in several countries, these two type of mutations are not uh, regulated as a GMO. They are pretty much treated similar to the conventional uh, breeding products. Whereas the SDN3 type, it depends because if your donor template is actually from the same plant species, then in that case, the integration is actually, is like cisgenic because 
the, uh, the gene is actually from the same plant species. But if this donor template is from outside of that plant species, then it is treated as a transgenic. So the regulation depend upon from where the gene insertion is uh, coming from. And, and also it varies from different countries. You know, some of the countries um, treat them as GM and some of the countries, if it is cisgenic, they don't treat us as GM as well. So let me give you briefly, like, you know, what are the different steps and the requirements for gene editing? So uh, for starting the gene editing, the very basic thing you need is the bioinformatics tool and the reference genome, because you need to know what you want to um, uh, target. So you need to know the sequence of the target gene. And, you know, in order to identify that targeted gene, you might have to do a lot of pathway analysis, you know, so that, you know, like, you know, if we target this, this gene, uh, we will achieve our, uh, the trait of our interest. Uh, so, and then based on that, you need the reference genome and, and based on that, you design and the guide RNA. And once your guide RNA are designed, then, you know, you have to put it in some a, a genetic cargo form so that because you have to deliver it into the, uh, into the plant genome. So you can either put it in a plasmid form or you can make the complexes like you could, you can get the Cas9 as pure protein and the guide RNA as RNA, and then you make the, the complex uh, ribonucleic protein complex, we also in a short call RNPs. And, and then, you know, so, so these are the two different ways uh, you can deliver, and then you need the transformation, like plant transformation facility, but also a plant transformation protocol for the crop you are interested in. And then you deliver these uh, uh, CRISPR uh, reagents into the plant cell, and then regenerate the, this plant cell into the whole plant. Uh, so that means you need the regeneration system as well. And on top of that, you need the regulatory framework of your country in order to support this type of research. Um, so uh, if I explain again, um, so you know, you using bioinformatic tool, you have done, you have uh, uh, identified the target site and designed the guide RNA. And then, you know, you can synthesize this guide RNA, as I mentioned, as, as you do the primers for the PCR. And then, you know, uh, the, then you have the Cas9, and then you bring those two together and deliver into the plant cell. You can use different ways of transformation, agrobacterium, microprojectile bombardment, or the protoplast. And then you regenerate the complete plantlets. And then once the complete plantlets has been regenerated, you have to analyze those plants for, for detecting the targeted mutation. But in the end, you have to also do the off-target uh, mutation analysis as well uh, to just uh, to check if there was no off-target uh, mutations. And then do the phenotyping. So we normally do this phenotyping in the, in the greenhouse. And once you have done the phenotyping, actually, then it can go into the breeding program. Because if they have um, insertion of the CRISPR gas reagent, because if you have used agrobacterium and the plasmid based delivery, then in that case, you need to do a back cross, but you have to do only one back cross and then get the progeny, segregate out the progeny, and pick the progeny which has the mutations in them, but no transgene integration in it. So it requires one only one step of uh, crossing as well. Uh, so gene editing, uh, the potential are, are real. We, we are already seeing the several uh, benefits of it. Uh, the CRISPR-Cas9, uh, because it has a lot of potential, it has been awarded the Nobel Prize in 2020 in in uh, in chemistry uh, two wonderful ladies the, the uh, emmanuel carpenter and jennifer doudna uh, they got the nobel prize uh, for that um right now the gene editing um, has been applied in more than 40 crops as i mentioned across 25 countries uh, mostly addressing the agronomy and the food and food quality of the biotic and abiotic stress tolerance. So you can use the genome editing for starting from the functional genomics, you can use it in functional genomics for gene discovery, but also can use for the nutritional enhancement, like, you know, uh, for biofortification, like, you know, or um, uh, like enhancing vitamins, 
changing the quality of the oil, starch, sugar, protein. You can also use it for the yield improvement, like you know, uh, increase weight, grain size, grain number, but also for the biotic stress resistance, a lot of work going on for creating the disease resistance, um, uh, resistance to different various pathogens like bacteria, viruses, fungi. Also used for abiotic stress tolerance like drought, salt, heat and cold, and then also for the herbicide uh, tolerance. There is already a lot of products actually in the pipeline uh, for these different uh, traits. So if, if I put side by side, like the conventional products, gene editing and the GM, and to give you like a, some idea about, about the regulations of this. And when I say regulation, I, I mean here the biosafety um, uh, regulation, uh, because none of the products are not regulated. They are regulated by, by one or another agencies. But here I'm more focusing on the biosafety uh, regulation, which is based on the biosafety law of different countries. So when the products are coming from um, breeding, uh, then these products are actually not regulated through the biosafety regulation. Okay, when you come to the gene editing, SDN1 type are actually, if there are no foreign gene integration in them, they are not regulated as GMO in several countries. SDN2 type is actually also in many, many countries, they are not regulated, but some countries are exceptional. SDN3 type, the, it all depends. Like, you know, if it has a new uh, gene insertion expression cassette there, or the final product contains any foreign DNA, but also it depends upon the country regulation as well. And as you know, all know the genetically modified uh, 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 products because they have the new DNA um, uh, or the gene um, expression cassette inserted in them. So the foreign product actually, con uh, the final product contains the foreign gene in them. So they are regulated by uh, the biosafety uh, regulations in all in 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 all the countries. Um, so for the crop improvement, you have different tools which can be used. Starting from conventional breeding, you can use conventional breeding. But a big limitation of the conventional breeding is in some of the crops actually the genetic diversity is pretty low, and that is that is limiting the conventional breeding. Then there is also the mutational breeding. Uh, but the mutational breeding is like quite uh, time consuming, but is also expensive because you have to screen a lot. And that's what, how it becomes expensive. Um, then there is the GM or the transgenic approach. So the transgenic approach is, uh, is good, but then uh, it has the regulatory complications. And, uh, and for that reason, the cost becomes uh, high as well. Um, uh, now then there is a newer technology, which is genome editing, where you have, you can do some like, you know, precise editing uh, and, and it is a very predictable uh, variation as well. So all these technologies are useful. And at one or another point, actually, you have to utilize all these, these technologies. So what I'm trying to say is not only one technology can solve the problem. Based on the, based on the problem uh, you, you have, you can decide which tool you want to use for, for developing the improved varieties. So uh, there are good examples of some of the gene edited products. And one of them is high oleic soybean oil, um, which is the first commercialized gene edited uh, food product um, in, in the US uh, market. Then there is a Japan, which has approved the very first gene edited uh, tomato um, called GABA. So the, these are the uh, tomatoes which are rich in uh, gamma amino butyric acid and they have the ability to fight against uh, the high blood uh, pressure. Japan has uh, recently also released uh, uh, another product, uh, uh, another plant product I'll say, which is Vaxicon. Uh, also uh, non-browning uh, mushroom was approved in US and, and Canada as non-GM and in, uh, in Colombia as well as uh, in, by USDA regulators. These are the rice which are resistant um, to blight 
disease and so they have been also been approved argentina brazil and colombia they have uh, approved uh, drought tolerant uh, soya bean as non gm and uh, towards the end of 2022 actually kenya approved uh, mln uh, maize lethal necrosis maize uh, for field trial uh, in in Kenya so as as non GM so they can go actually into the open field trial so that that trial will be started uh, soon in in Kenya so gene editing they have uh, uh, as I mentioned they are relatively accessible affordable and so for that reason actually a lot of work is going on in the public and the small private sector in comparison to everything into the uh, big private sector. Uh, it can address important uh, uh, SDG, sustainable development goals. So basically like, you know, zero hunger and the, the climate actions because it's enhancing global food, food and the nutrition security and livelihoods can mitigate the climate change and supporting more sustainable agriculture system. But in order to do so, what we need is the enabling environment with science-based regulatory guideline for the release and the adoption of the gene additive uh, products. Let me give you an example of what's going on um, in Africa. So there are several projects uh, going on. Um, so like, for example, in, in Egypt, the, the researchers are working on uh, the drought tolerant wheat using CRISPR-Cas. In e Ethiopia, they are working on uh, TEF. TEF is a staple food crop um, in Ethiopia, and they are working on um, the semi dwarf uh, lodging resistant, but they are also working on improving the oil quality of the Ethiopian uh, mustard. Uh, in uh, in Uganda, uh, the researchers are working on cassava, particularly for synchronizing uh, flowers. In Kenya, there are a lot of projects going on. Um, like my lab is working on banana and and as well as on yam. Uh, there is, as I mentioned, there is a work going on on MLN resistant maize. There is also striga tolerant uh, sorghum, and there, there, there is a project on the virus resistant uh, potato. In South Africa, they are working on virus resistant cassava. In uh, Nigeria, also they are working on cassava for different traits, like you know, uh, disease resistance, but also enhancing uh, micronutrients. In Ghana. Researchers are working on sweet potatoes and in Burkina Faso on, on rice. Uh, so just give you a little bit idea on how um, the global overview is for the legislation of the gene editing. So the countries which you see shaded in green, uh, these are the countries where there is already the guideline present for the genome edited crop, crops. And they are not regulated as GM if there is no foreign gene integration in them. And, and uh, you can see like, you know, Canada, US and several countries in Latin America, Australia, India, China, Philippines, Japan, um, but also uh, countries, African countries like Nigeria, Kenya, Malawi, they have developed these guidelines. And very recently, actually, um, almost like a month back, um, UK has actually also approved that guideline. And based on that guideline, if the final product uh, doesn't have any foreign gene integration in them, they are not regulated as GM. And the countries which are shaded in yellow, these are the countries where um, the discussions are ongoing and they are in final stages of, of developing the guideline. And uh, several countries like, you know, uh, Ethiopia and Ghana uh, and Burkina Faso are actually uh, in, that, in that category. Only the countries which are shaded in red, these are the countries like, you know, Europe, South Africa, New Zealand. These are the countries where uh, if uh, the gene edited uh, products are actually treated similar to the genetically modified like GM. GMOs. Um, yeah. So basically, if, uh, if practically, if you're developing, you need to understand how and you will, uh, which path you will follow for, um, for the product to be released. So if you have developed using uh, 
CRISPR. Uh, so basically the gene edited products when they are developed, is like by case by case, because you need to understand your product first, whether it has any foreign gene integration or it has no foreign gene integration in them. So if there is no foreign gene integration in them, then it will go in the pathway of the non-GM and uh, like basically the same pathway, like the way the new hybrids or the new uh, product coming out from the mutagenesis are going. So, you know, you, they go into the, into the field trials um, and, and then basically you approach the, uh, the conventional regulators. Like I know in Kenya, we approach CAFIS. Uh, so, so like for the seed registration. So you follow the, the, uh, the guideline of your specific country and, 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 and um, um, proceed with the seed registration after the field trial and 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 all the testing there. But if 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 the product has the foreign gene integration in them, then they are treated as GM. And and in that case, you know you have to go to the field trials for the regulatory uh, registration, and and then follow the biosafety guideline for for that specific country to do the risk assessment on the genetic uh, mo uh, modification. Uh, and and then after that you can actually uh, file the dossier uh, for the uh, environmental and the commercial release of the transgenic um, event. Um, now what I will do is I will um, I've uh, talked about a lot of things, but now I'll give you practical um, example um, from uh, banana. So banana and plantain. And this is one of they are one of the major staple food crops grown in over 136 uh, countries uh, and with the with the pro uh, production uh, uh, more than 170 uh, uh, million uh, million tons there you know when we talk about the uh, uh, banana actually in uh, in many countries actually it is basically uh, the fruit crop um, uh, but when it comes to the Africa, actually is a staple food crop, and then it is actually used as like you know like like you can see like the the dishes uh, here uh, as well. So for that reason, it is actually a very very valuable food security and the crash and the cash crop. Um, and, you know, it's some of the African countries like, you know, Uganda, Rwanda, these are the countries where the production, um, uh, like, you know, the consumption of the banana is very high, is about 191 kilograms per year per person, you know, you can see which relates to about 0 0.7 kilogram daily per person. So, you know, in some of the countries, the bananas are, are like very, very important part of their daily, uh, daily diet. And it's still there are a, a huge yield gap in this is the cooking banana and these are the plantains in both of them. And there are several reasons for that, but the, the main reason are the, the diseases and pests. So banana has a lot of uh, diseases and pests. Um, several diseases affects banana plantation like, you know, uh, fungal diseases like black cigatoka, fusarium will, there are, there are also this bacterial disease, the bacteria will and uh, viruses like banana bungee top virus, banana streak virus. But then there are uh, also the pests like, like nematodes um, and weevils. The, the problem is not only that, that different pests and pathogens are present, but the problem is this, that, you know, they, uh, many of them actually coexist. So, you know, in the same field, more than one pathogen and pest can be seen. As you see from this uh, figure, you know, you have multicolors uh, uh, dots, that means they are present in, in that place. So at IATA, we have very strong uh, uh, genetic improvement program for banana, and we utilize all different technologies as I was keep on emphasize that you have to do uh, use the, all the technologies or the tools available. So we have uh, um, at IATA, we have very strong conventional breeding program. And as uh, several uh, of you might know that, you know, there are very few uh, banana breeding programs uh, 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 globally. So we have that and, and we also apply the biotech and in the biotech, we are doing into the transgenic, which is a, a, a approach, and as well as the gene editing um, approach. So for gene editing, we are working on uh, three different traits, the banana streak virus, the banana xanthomonas will, uh, 
and the fusarium wells, and then we are still working on the transgenic approach on some of the traits as well, because the transgenic approach is very good for when we want to work on the on the pest, and so we are still using that that tool. Um, before I proceed, I just wanted to show you how the the, the about the banana genome because some of uh, my slides will touch on that. So it's better that you, you get some knowledge there. So, you know, banana came from uh, two different uh, uh, progenitors, um, uh, diploid progenitors. So it is um, uh, Musa acuminata, which is AA genome, and then Musa balbiciana, which has BB genome. And most of the cultivated varieties of banana are triploids. So they are either triple A, or uh, they can be AAB, which are mainly the plantains and the Mysore silk type, poem type. And they can be also ABBs like Pisangavak and, and Blugoy. Uh, but some of, in some countries, particularly in Asia, actually, there are some diploids cultivated as well, like, like Pisan mass has AA genome and Nepuvan has, I know Nepuvan is grown in India, like AB. And, and then there are some hybrids also, which are tetraploids. Um, but most of the hybrids which are released are actually also the triploid, uh, the triploid hybrids. Uh, so uh, we started at IATA, we started working on gene editing in 2015. You know, the first report of CRISPR-Cas editing came in 2013. And uh, we adopted this technology for banana in 2015. Like, you know, so you can see very, uh, um, as, as the technology was is still in his infant stage, we, we adopted it for banana. So in order to, uh, to utilize the technology, actually to apply it, uh, we need to establish the uh, efficient uh, system, and that's what we did. So we we established uh, CRISPR-Cas9 based um, uh, genome editing for for banana and plantain, and using different uh, genomic groups. So we tried for AAA and as well as um, AAB as well, and we used a visual marker uh, called phytoin desaturase. So this PDS is actually involved in the this carotene pathway and then and the PDS uh, if the PDS is functional you get the green plants but somehow if you make the PDS non-functional by creating the targeted mutation uh, in this gene uh, which also we call knockout then you get the albino plants as we see here so we designed the guide RNA uh, uh, from the two different exons uh, of this gene and we put everything together with the Cas9, and then we delivered that them into the cell suspension of banana and generated the plant. So, and by phenotype, we already see that you know these are mutated, but we also did the sequencing of the target uh, to check the targeted mutation. And and as I was saying, there are small changes. So you know you can see most of them has very small, like you know three one base pair or three base pair. Uh, the deletion in them. Uh, once we established the, the tool, then, you know, we worked on the trait, uh, the banana streak virus registrin. Uh, this streak virus uh, is a double-stranded DNA badna virus, uh, which integrates into the B genome of, of the uh, host plant and is treated as the endogenous banana streak virus. So B genome is present in plantain. So banana streak virus is actually basically a big problem in, in plantain. This virus has bonopartite genome, as you see here. Uh, we also call it episomal form. And in so this virus has three open eating frames, open eating frame one, two, uh, are very small and they are mainly involved in the virion assembly. And open eating frame three is actually the one which is actually uh, codes for all, um, all the important genes of the virus, like, you know, mopin protein, code protein, aspartic protease, reserve, uh, um, the tra uh, reverse transcriptase, and RNAs H. And these, these uh, actually, the ORF3 is basically a, a polyprotein which get cleaves at the aspartic protease and, uh, and to make the functional protein. 
Um, so this virus actually, it, uh, it gets, as I said, it gets integrated into the bee genome. And when it is integrated, is it can be like a multiple copies, but it always integrate at the single locus in the bee genome. And we know which the locus is. And once it is integrated, it can sit very quietly as like it is a part of the of the plant genome and doesn't plant doesn't show even any symptom of of the disease. But during the stress condition, that is stress can be the environmental stress like change in the temperature uh, or or drought. But the stress can be also the tissue culture because banana is a vegetatively propagated crop and is normally multiplied in tissue culture or during a hybridization crossing. And in that case, actually, um, this integrated banana gets activated into the uh, episomal form. And that's when the plant shows uh, these very beautiful streaks. And for that reason, actually, uh, this uh, presence of the uh, streak virus uh, has become a major challenge for breeding, but also the dissemination of the hybrids and the jump as a movement of the plantain from uh, from uh, countries uh, from one country to another. Um, and also, breeder cannot use the deployed Musa Balbisiana, which has BB genome in their breeding program, even though this this deployed has a lot of robust resistance to several you know, several diseases. So uh, we thought like, okay, we can use the gene editing to basically uh, inactivate uh, this integrated form so that even under the stress condition, this doesn't get activated into the episomal form. Um, so the strategy I have used was like, you know, uh, let's knock out all three open reading frame so we designed a guide from open reading frame one and two, but in open reading frame three, we actually designed a guide from the aspartic protease because my intention was that if I make aspartic protease non-functional, basically because it is a polyprotein, it will not be cleaved. And then in that case, you know, all these, all these essential genes will be, remain uh, non-functional. Uh, so we we selected a farmer preferred plantain from Uganda, uh, Gonja Manjaya, and we have first characterized that plantain to understand what pattern of integration of this virus or what viruses are present in, in that, that plantain. So we did a lot of molecular characterization and we saw the integration of in, in the similar fashion what we, we, we got from, from the literature. And, and then we designed, as I mentioned, we designed the three guides and we put all the three guides together with the Cas9. We introduced them into the cell suspension. We re regenerated the complete plantlet. And you see, this is our edited plant. This is our control uh, wild type plant. And then, you know, there was no phenotypically difference between them. Then we did the molecular characterization to detect the, uh, uh, the mutations, which we have. And then after that, we have actually um, evaluated these plants in the greenhouse under the stress condition. Because uh, you remember I mentioned that, you know, drought is one of the stress which actually uh, activate this virus. So we mimic the drought, we didn't plant these uh, potted plants. And so this is our wild type plant. You can see very nice yellow streak. Uh, whereas our mutants, like, so our majority of mutants actually didn't show any symptom at all. But these were the two mutants which actually showed the symptom, a slight symptom. And the reason behind that, that these two mutants has mutation only in the open reading frame one and two, but they didn't have the mutation in the open reading frame three, which is actually the crucial for the, for the development of the, of the symptoms. So now we have the proof of concept for inactivating uh, the integrated uh, uh, banana uh, streak virus in the bee genome of the plantain. And now we are actually editing um, uh, some of the parents so that, you know, they can be, uh, they can be crossed and then the hybrid can be generated where uh, the edited, um, uh, where the integrated banana streak virus are inactivated. If you want to read more, actually, this is all published. It is published in Communication Biology, and you can you can see the details of, of this work there. Uh, let me briefly touch on a second example, which is the banana xanthomonas uh, wilt. And this is a bacterial wilt. Uh, 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 
a, a disease which was first reported on NSAID um, long back, like about 50, 60 years back in, in Ethiopia. And it was very much confined for NSAID for a long time before it was reported on, um, on bananas. And later on, actually, in early 2004, this disease was reported in, uh, uh, in uh, Uganda. And once it was reported in Uganda, actually, it spread very fast to the, uh, to the all uh, major banana growing area in the Great Lakes region of Africa, like, like to uh, Kenya, Tanzania, Rwanda, Burundi, and DR Congo. The economic losses, uh, like, you know, you can see the losses can be 40 to 80% because of this disease. And the major problem is that this disease is spread very fast. Once it is there in the field, it can wipe off the, the all the banana plantation in that field within few months of time. Uh, all the cultivated varieties are susceptible for this disease. Uh, only there are uh, some uh, wild type progenitors like, you know, uh, Musa balbisiana, which has complete resistance to the disease, but also there are few uh, other like Musa acuminata subspecies, Zebrana and Benkesai, they have tolerance um, against this disease. But you know that the Musa balbisiana breeders don't use into their breeding program. Um, the overall economic losses estimated over the decade is between two to eight billion uh, because of this. Like you see, uh, once the field is infected, then all the plants needs to be uprooted and the yield is actually zero. Um, and then the field needs to be left fallow for some time um, before it can be replanted by by the clean planting uh, material so in that case you know the resistance uh, has been the best and the most uh, cost effective um, method so we uh, we started working on the transgenic approach that time uh, and and uh, we developed the transgenic bananas by over expressing two different genes uh, from capsicum anum and one is plant feridoxin like protein and another is the uh, the hypersensitive response assisting protein pflp and hra and uh, after generating the the plants we first tested them under the uh, laboratory condition uh, and then into the uh, greenhouse condition so these are our control plants non transgenic and these are our transgenic plants after that we have done several confined field trials to check for the uh, like um, the durability of the trait but also the agronomic performance of these transgenic bananas so these are the transgenic bananas in uganda and we worked in collaboration with with naro uh, in uganda and kalro in in kenya and this is all published so if you want to read more about this technology you can also read there uh, and so this is our transgenic uh, banana you can see uh, no symptoms of the uh, of the disease, bacterial disease here. And this is the control non-transgenic, which actually got completely wilted. So uh, this is the transgenic bunch. Actually, from the non-transgenic uh, 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 control plants, mostly they have wilted before producing any bunches at all. But even though if they have produced uh, a few bunch, actually they were also showing the disease. Uh, uh, as you can see from here, the, the most of the fruits are rotten. Uh, after that, we also tested, uh, so we tested those plants for five different generation for the Ducey's disease durability. And then uh, we, we tested for the non-target effect of PFLP and HRAP protein on the soil microorganism. And we have not, uh, our study has not shown any effect on the non-target microorganisms in soil. We also did a lot of biosafety um, uh, work for, of the, for the PFLP and HRAP. So we used bioinformatics analysis uh, to assess the potential risk of the allergenicity and toxicity and no convincing evidence was found to suggest that any of these two proteins represent any risk of uh, allergy or toxicity to humans and and so this is also published we because uh, as per the requirement we actually asked a third party to do this analysis and we also didn't find uh, a, a, any uh, 
uh, any evidence against that. Uh, we also did the potential adoption of the of the genetically modified uh, banana for the BXW, and we did that in six different countries in East Africa, uh, in in Burundi, DR Congo, Kenya, Rwanda, Tanzania, and Uganda. And these are the we selected these countries because these are the countries where the bacterial disease is 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 really uh, uh, a problem. And so, uh, if you can see, these are the uh, projected adoption rate. And we saw that you know the the GM bananas for bacterial wilt resistance, it, the adoption will really start slow, but after some time the adoption will reach to the hundred percent. Um, and uh, one interesting point here is like you know, uh, we saw that our adoption rate was actually projected uh, high in those countries where the disease is also uh, is is high. Like for example in DR Congo, that's where is the major hit of this disease and that's why uh, also um, the adoption was projected uh, to be to be very high um, then we also did like a survey of the farmers consumers and traders to understand uh, the willingness to adopt these bananas and about 65 percent uh, people said that you know they will adopt uh, immediately um, about 19 percent said like okay they will adopt but at a later stage uh, when they will see the performance of these bananas uh, um, in in the neighbor's field, like how they are performing before they are adopting, uh, fair enough. And then there were only 16% which says not at all, which is not actually a very, very, a very big risk for any product uh, development. Um, later, so later on, we moved uh, to also uh, understand and, and working on the gene editing for the BXW resistant. Uh, so you remember I mentioned that the uh, Musa Balbisiana, which has the BB genome and breeders don't use that, uh, that one into the breeding program, actually has complete resistance to the BXW disease. So we, we understood, uh, we did a lot of study to understand the molecular uh, basis of the disease resistance in, in this Musa Balbisiana. And right now, what we are doing is that we are transferring the information uh, based on the, the, our study from the Musa Balbisiana into the susceptible uh, varieties. Uh, we are, uh, mind my words, I'm saying transferring the information. So we are not transferring any gene. We are actually based on that information. We are developing the gene editing strategy for, for developing the resistance into the the susceptible varieties. Uh, so in order to understand the molecular basis of the disease resistance in Musa Balbisiana, uh, we did the comparative transcriptome analysis. So uh, we infected the Musa Balbisiana plants and as well as the most susceptible variety Pisangawa. And then we did at different point level uh, the RNA seq analysis, and with based on the RNA seq, we got a lot of differentially expressed genes, and then we have mapped those ones against the biotic um, uh, and metabolic pathways, and from there we understood the molecular basis, and based on that work, we actually identified a lot of uh, uh, targets for the for editing, like some of the susceptibility genes involved for the disease development, transporter genes, some of the transcription factors involved as the negative regulator of, of defense uh, pathway. So what we are now doing, we know that you know there are several defense genes which are present. Even they are they are they are, they are um, present in the Musa Balbisiana. They are also present in uh, in the susceptible variety, but they are not expressing to the level they should be, and that's the reason we use the CRISPR activation technology. Uh, and with the CRISPR activation technology, we can actually simultaneously activate some of these endogenous genes. So we are activating three genes uh, simultaneously. Uh, and, and then uh, we tested, we developed uh, these plants and we are testing them under the greenhouse condition. As you can see, several of these plants has not shown any symptom. And these are our uh, non-edited uh, plants. And we did some molecular uh, like a, uh, QRT-PCR to also check the activation of these genes. So these are the plants which has we have activated P 
PR1, RPM1, and the work 5 simultaneously in the same, same plant. Uh, the another uh, way of uh, developing the resistance we are trying is actually knocking out the susceptibility gene. And one of the susceptibility genes we are knocking out is called downy mildew resistance, so DMR6. We have identified the DMR6 ortholog in banana using the phylogeny. And, and so we have identified that gene for, for editing. So, so DMR6 is a very well characterized susceptibility gene. And this gene gets activated during the host pathogen interaction. And we have also tested that, seen it, it that in banana. So, you know, when we infect our, our susceptible plant, uh, we see it, there is a, a 60 fold increase in, in the DMR6 gene in, in that uh, plant, whereas in Musa Balbisiana, there was no activation. So, this, this gave us confidence to actually knock out. Uh, this gene, because uh, once it is um, um, activated, it also suppresses the, the plant immunity. So we have actually used the same approach. We designed the guide RNA targeting the exon of this gene, and we have delivered the CRISPR-Cas reagents into the banana cells, and we, we regenerated the complete plant. We have very rapid bioassay uh, in our lab using the small tissue culture plant, so we use that. Uh, to actually um, identify the resistant mutants. So we got the resistant mutant. These are our uh, uh, non edited control plants. We also did the uh, target sequencing to identify the target mutations. And then further, we test them under the greenhouse uh, condition. So this is the non mutant, and this is the mutant showing no symptom at all. This is also published in Plant Biotech recently. And uh, this, uh, then further, we have also tested this uh, like a, a plant growth. So we measured the leaf area and the plant height and the plant girth um, in, with the potted plants to actually to see if, uh, if the knockout of this gene has any detrimental effect on plant growth. But uh, we have not seen uh, any negative impact of knocking out of this gene on the plant growth. And uh, so we are now planning actually to test these plants under the field condition uh, to see uh, their yield and also the trait uh, durability. Um, so in the end, I will also say that gene editing is basically relatively newer technology. And you know, when the technology is new, there is also the fear. So basically uh, as a scientist, or a researchers is it becomes our collective um, uh, responsibility actually to do the communication to the public, to the regulator, to the journalist, to understand so uh, science-based communication so, so that they understand the science uh, uh, behind the gene editing. So uh, my group, we are heavily involved in that and we do, we use different platforms. Uh, we, we, we are collaborating uh, with different organizations like, you know, um, Alliance for Science, uh, we use the platform like, you know, Science Stories Africa, where, where we tell the stories to them. I also try to bring the journalist to our lab to show them uh, the material so that, you know, uh, they can see how we are doing, how the, the, the plants look like so that they can get some comfortable. We also bring all different people, including the researchers, the young, uh, particularly the young researchers, journalists, regulators together. Uh, for some some training and this work also we are collaborating with uh, with Alliance for Science there, um, and this was like also the the workshop uh, we bring everyone together. In addition to that, I'm also training young researchers like PhD student. Of uh, we have already uh, two of the PhD students have already graduated uh, in in gene editing, and then right now I have I have uh, four other students working on gene editing in my lab. Um, another thing what we have started with in collaboration with uh, University of California, uh, Davis and, and uh, Berkeley in US, and we started this, uh, this CRISPR technology under the African Plant Breeders Academy uh, CRISPR course, and we are working with different partners on this one, and um, we are training uh, African 
um, scientist for the CRISPR technology. And uh, so our idea is to train about like 50 to 80 um, scientists in the uh, over like maybe in the period of four to five years. And the first batch of researchers has actually started this year in, in January. And they are actually getting hands-on training in my lab. And we give them training. So these are like 11 scientists from seven different countries in, in, in Africa. Um, and uh, after they finish their training, they will go back to their institution and also try to implement gene editing for the crop uh, important to their country and the, the traits they are interested in. And we will provide them actually some seed money to actually start this there, but as well as the mentorship, you know, so that, you know, they can, they can really establish gene editing and apply that tool in addition to the, to the other tools they are using right now. Um, so the few uh, key take home messages are like agriculture production, uh, as I mentioned, needs to be doubled to feed the growing population. Um, Africa has potential uh, to increase two to three times more cereal grains and other staple food crops, um, and, but it requires the agriculture innovation and CRISPR has rapidly become the most popular genome engineering approach due to its simplicity, efficiency, specificity, uh, multiplexing, and it also is easy to adapt. Uh, gene edited crops with no foreign gene integration are treated very much similar to the conventional crop in several countries. And uh, uh, its application has been shown in uh, many crops, like more than 40 crops so far now. And I have also shown you some of the uh, benefits of using CRISPR-Cas technologies, and we have demonstrated developing the disease-resistant uh, bananas in my lab in Africa. Uh, in the end, I would like to acknowledge uh, my team, the plant transformation team, the bioinformatics, the virologists, and also my partners from University of California, Alliance for Science, um, ATF, uh, NARO, and also the financial support from USAID and the CGIR research uh, program. Uh, thank you very much. I'll be uh, happy to take any question. Uh, thanks, ma'am. Uh, uh, I have collected 14, 15 questions and more. And uh, basically, as you know, it, uh, many people are asking about the safety and how it is safe or not. But yes, there are Two, three, fifty uh, really good questions. Uh, we'll come uh, after your interview session, and still, I'm going to collect all many questions or many more from the YouTube. Shoma, please go for the interview session, ma'am. It's a great, great presentation, great slides, and everybody uh, is admiring uh, for your slide and presentation skill. And definitely, skill wise, I <laughs> what I can say. Uh, uh, and a lot of African peoples are uh, asking a lot of questions about uh, their opportunity as a postdoc, their opportunity as a join your lab, their opportunity to get fund from IITA and all. And uh, yes, we'll try to address two, three questions from there. And uh, many people are asking that is the recording. Yes, recording is available in this channel. And it's the same link. You can uh, view uh, as much uh, you want. It is available here. Shoma, go for the interaction session. Thank you. Ma'am, uh, we will now start this uh, section, uh, which is the, you know, getting to know the scientists better. So, uh, ma'am, uh, you are an inspiration to young women researchers everywhere. Uh, you, our viewers will be highly interested to learn about your journey and how you built your career. Could you please share it with us? Yeah, okay, thank you. Um, so basically, um, as you know, I, I studied master's in, uh, in molecular biology and then uh, PhD in plant molecular biology. So that's where the career starts, you know, because uh, it's very important what you choose uh, for, for your study. Um, so, uh, you know, I was, um, since childhood, my dream was to actually somehow do something 
uh, for uh, for the like you know well being of the of humans you know uh, uh, but you know when i was very small i didn't know what i only knew like okay only doctors can do that so i wanted to also become a medical doctor uh, but then at one point i said like no uh, means like i can also do something else and 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 definitely uh, you know you have mentors at your home so you know my dad was my mentor so you know he also uh, when i was still in my um, high school actually he actually exposed me uh, to biochemistry and and then when i went to do my undergrad actually then he told me oh no now there is this biotechnology which is very new technology and and so why don't you uh, study that so i did my masters in biotechnology all credit goes to him uh, because he really showed me so much interest in that like you know i became interested and so i did that uh, but still even in my masters i was not sure if i will work on plants because uh my my masters was more on the molecular like cloning and other things and during my towards i was finishing my master i became very much interested to utilize this technology into the into the plants you know and that's why i started working uh, on for my phd i worked on chickpea the legumes you know uh, uh, which are very important uh, uh, protein source uh, and you know as in india there are a lot of vegetarian so legumes are really big protein source for everybody uh, so i worked on chickpea and then I, from after finishing my phd i moved to us that's where i did my uh, my postdoc and uh, i continued uh, on uh, legumes and i worked on soya bean and when i was working on uh, soya bean that's when actually there was a scientist who visited uh, my lab from from iata because iata wanted to establish uh, this new technology for the crops they were working on uh, in in nigeria so he came basically for training he spent a uh, few months with me in uh, uh, in my lab learning uh, uh, the legume transformation and during that you know we were working very closely during that interaction i came to know about iita about africa about need of trading capacity building in in africa and then by the time he was leaving actually he asked me that whether i would like to join iita because he said like you know in africa those days i'm talking about 1999 and those days there were not many phd's in biotech in in africa um, so you know and iita was like uh, establishing this new facility so so he basically offered me a job to to join iita and and then you know i thought twice that yeah i'm in a very good lab in us and now from us moving to nigeria i didn't know i've never visited africa before uh, but only one thing which has motivated me to go to to africa was i thought like okay there are thousands of people like me in in india in us but if i can move to africa where actually they need this capacity and if i can go and train people and build capacity i will make some impact and for that reason actually i moved to to africa uh, to to iita and and i'm the first one who established actually banana uh, transgenic uh, platform uh, at iita and i have uh, since then actually definitely uh, i have been moved up on the ladder you know from scientist to senior scientist to principal scientist then to deputy director and now i'm the director of uh, east africa where i manage six different countries so in addition to the research um i'm also a leader i um, as a director but i'm also um, uh, leading the whole biotech platform across different uh, station of of iit working on different crops i'm not only working on bananas i gave example of banana but i work on other crops like uh, uh like cassava oh. yam uh, mm -hmm. i've also um, uh, worked on anset which is a, a, a staple food crop um, in ethiopia so one time i was leading a project it was a bmgf uh, funded project for almost 6 years where i was trying to build a capacity on anset uh in in ethiopia and uh, my 
one of the EIR staff who was a, post, a PhD student in my lab now actually is uh, leading the NSET transgenic work uh, in, in Ethiopia. I have traveled uh, or, or lived in different countries uh, from Nigeria, I moved to Uganda. Um, then uh, in Uganda, I worked very closely with Naro. Then I moved to uh, Kenya uh, and that's where my lab is still my lab is, but as a director now I'm based in. Um, in Dar es Salaam. Um, so I will say that, you know, uh, my my dream has not completely fulfilled yet because I still want to see uh, the banana products um, in the hands of the smallholder farmers. That's one side. But on the capacity building, I'm, I'm pretty happy because I've done a lot. I have, um, there are about 36 PhD students uh, who have been graduated. Uh, work, uh, doing their research uh, in my lab for for uh, and and also I, I have provided short term training for over three hundred uh, scientists uh, from different parts of Africa in my lab and now now we are doing this uh, basically for the CRISPR CRISPR technology. Yeah. Truly amazing. And being a person in your position, how do you manage time for both administration and research? Um, so you see, administ for me, the way I manage is administration uh, or management. Let me say management. I'm not doing that much of administration. Uh, I, I do have the, so I more provide like a leadership and managing uh, thing. So that is my job and research is my passion. So I think, uh, you know, uh, then, you know, like, you know, mingling passion into your job becomes uh, becomes easy. And, and then uh, you also, uh, because you know, um, my position as a regional director is quite demanding because it's, it requires a lot of uh, a travel, but a lot of like engagement with the government, engagement with the senior management at IATA, but also with donors with, uh, with, within IATA. That takes a lot of time. So it's still uh, my research to be, um, like you know, going on uh, with that the same efficiency the way it was before, or even even more. Um, I also need uh, a very good team. So you know, I have excellent team, uh, both into the administration as well as in my research uh, group, and you know that actually helps me uh, achieving uh, what I set my goals. Yeah. I cannot do that alone, you know, without, without my strong team, yeah. I'm not what I am. It's always teamwork. Yeah. Uh, Ma'am, uh, what do you find most interesting about working with gene edited crops? Uh, so I think the most interesting part, like, you know, is basically uh, the traits, which, you know, the other technologies, other conventional technologies um, are, are have bottlenecks or challenges. And some of those traits, when if we can handle them uh, using the gene editing, that's the most exciting. Like, like the example, the banana streak virus, I gave the example, actually uh, long back, we tried to uh, understand and handle that trait using RNAi technology. Uh, but then, you know, with RNAi technology, not every time you can have 100% knockout. So that technology didn't work for us. But now when we use gene editing, we got the desired results. And, and it's the same thing for the banana bacteria world. Because there is uh, no resistance in the germ plasm, which breeders are using for crossing. So that means the conventional breeding cannot be applied. Uh, but based on the information from the wild type banana, uh, we can actually tweak the genome of the banana to, um, uh, to the uh, susceptible variety to bring the resistance in them. So I think that's what the most exciting part is that for gene editing, we can bring some information from the wild type species and we can also, you know, so that's that's the most exciting uh, uh, part of the gene editing, I will, I will say for me, yeah. Uh, Ma'am, what is your opinion on digital agriculture? Yeah, so, you know, uh, digital agriculture is very, very important. And, you know, at uh, at IETA, actually, we already started uh, uh, utilizing that because uh, you see, like, uh, when farmers are seeing some diseases, they know, okay, maybe that might be the disease. But, you know, if we can use some digital apps for, so that they can 
easily detect the disease, you know, instead of taking the samples to the lab or something. And then based on that, you know, uh, so what we are trying to do at IIT is we are trying to bring all different apps at one platform. So, you know, we have some, some apps like, you know, uh, Nuru app, uh, where, which we can use to detect uh, the, the diseases. But once you have detected the disease, you know, if they can also get advices what to do, you know, from where to source the resistant varieties, uh, where are the certified the seeds. So, you know, we also had the seed tracker, uh, which can actually link them uh, where you, they can so, source the, the, the quality certified seed. And, and then, you know, uh, then, you know, you can also go into the precision agriculture, you know. Uh, so if you can combine everything, I will say that the digital uh, technology, uh, uh, digital agriculture with combination with AI is the future of agriculture. Ma'am, uh, due to technological advancement and digitalization, many professions are being upgraded or changing the ways in which they work. In that regard, what do you see as the future of farmers of developing countries? Um, so I feel like, you know, uh, the farmers of developing countries are also, you know, they, they uh, I feel like they are very curious to know about the new technologies uh, and, and also, you know, to apply them. Um, and and so I think the, the farmers in the developing countries also can use the digital, like a more precision agriculture, but also the mechanization, because uh, that's where I see the difference between the developing and the developed countries, you know, because the in most of the developing countries, the mechanization at the farm level is still, uh, it, it is there, but not not completely there. So, you know, if they can, if the farmers, like I see like the farmers more going into the um, uh, uh, digital um, applications and the mechanization and, and also irrigation, these are the, the technologies which I feel like, you know, and then, you know, their uh, uh, accessibility to the improved seed because that's very important, you know, that's the key. And, and the seed, not alone, but in the package, you know, so the seeds with all other inputs which farmers require. And from where the farmers, so, you know, so that's where the digital apps can help, like, you know, farmers, the information on their tips, like, you know, where they can source those ones and then applying uh, the mechanization. So I, that's where I see farmers moving on. And I, I can see in some countries, I already started seeing the farm. The farmers are like really the smart people. You know, they are always, they look, they keep on looking for the new technologies more than us. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Ma'am, uh, what are your views on the role of women in agriculture? Uh, that's very tough, uh, very tough question, but let me put it. So, so the, you know, women has very, very important role in agriculture because you see, when you start from the, uh, from the demand, from the food, you know, is the woman who, who tell, you know, like, okay, what, where, what, like, even though when they are improved varieties, which variety is more, when, when is the woman who will say like, okay, whether their kids are getting enough nutrition or not, you know, so uh, demand for the, uh, like, you know, enhance uh, vitamins or something that also that that comes. So, you know, women is like key even in the demand. Uh, and then it is starts down there. If you see uh, farmers, there are a lot of farmers who are uh, women. And that's where they are also need for the mechanization so that, you know, the farming should be less uh, labor intensive so that, you know, uh, can benefit uh, women and then then when uh, when it comes to the research uh, you will see you know okay it might be different in different but, uh, but you know some of the fields they are more women than uh, than men um, for example in biotech i always see there are uh, if you come to my lab you will find more women than men uh, because i feel uh, that's the field one uh, women are, are are more interested and and uh, so I think we need to think of promoting uh, the technologies which are uh, more helpful for the women farmer uh, and also keeping uh, their need when you're designing, uh, uh, like, you know, developing new varieties, always keep uh, the woman um, into the picture so that we know their needs are fulfilled. 
uh, what they need and 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 training uh, training more women at each level you know uh, starting from um, the the farmers but also even in the research and even in the leadership i think i i would like to see more women into the leadership uh, where where i feel like it's still there are not that many mm -hmm. Uh, Ma'am, uh, which sector of plant science research do you think is most likely to prosper in the near future? Uh, I will not pick anyone. I will say that all uh, different uh, are required because, you know, that's what I was keep on trying to say that, you know, um, it's not a silver bullet that, you know, like, you know, Oh, biotech can solve all the problem or agronomy can solve all the problem. No, all these tools need to be together. So I will say all the fields are, are important. All right. Uh, Ma'am, uh, what are your strategies while collaborating with other researchers, stakeholders and partners for the, adv for the advancement of your goals and outcomes? So, so you see... Uh, we work um we work with uh, as i mentioned that you know i believe in teams and and so the collaboration it starts with the, within the institute so like for for example uh, i'm a molecular biologist so i have collaborations with breeders with pathologists with agronomists entomologists you know all those people are from internal but i have a lot of external uh, collaborations as well and basically for me the thumb rule for the collaboration is to complement each other not to compete that's the first rule and then you know you have to have the trust among among different uh, collaborators uh, so you know when we when we design our new projects that's when i build like the collaboration a collaboration cannot come in the end it mm -hmm. needs to right. start when you start the project, you need to know uh, who, where. So, so you know, then uh, we decide like, okay, so this project needs this and this and this. So for this reason, okay, IET can do this. We need this other collaborator. We have the national partner. We have regional partners. And what are the, they, then there are clear defined roles for them. Hmm. So that, so that, you know, in the end, uh, we complement and, and our aims and our, our aim and goals are, are the same. We all want to reach to the same uh, goal, and and then we work we work together for that, and we respect each other and we trust each other. Ma'am, uh, you are an editorial board member for renowned journals. Uh, it would be a wonderful gift to our viewers if they get some tips from you on how to improve manuscripts. Okay, <laughs> yeah. So so basically. Um, you have to write, uh, first of all, you shouldn't delay in publishing if you have some um, very good result. Uh, you might not know who other groups are working on the same results. So try to be the first one to publish. That's very, uh, because you know, the novelty is, is everything for that. If you go to the high impact journal, that's the key that your, uh, your research needs to be novel. Um, and so, you know, that's one, then, you know, always uh, try to um, write uh, without jargons and very clear, but, you know, try to bring innovation, strong signs into the manuscript. And if you feel like, you know, you have, uh, you need some editing help. Hmm. Now, nowadays, actually, many uh, um, uh, this publishing societies have these services or some of the journals have those services. So they can also take help of those uh, um, editing services so that so that the paper is well, well crafted. Uh, put very nice high resolution pictures. You know, you know, sometimes what you cannot, what you uh, can understand by reading 10 papers, one picture tells you that, you know. So try to put really good figures um, into the into the manuscript yeah ma'am when you hire a person to work with you or join your team what qualities do you look for other than academic qualities yeah so, so another than uh, academic quality for me because you know uh, i already have a group so mm -hmm. uh, so like you know i have a established well established lab 
So I also try to see the the personality of that person if that that person that that fits uh, mm -hmm. within within the group. So that means that person has the uh, skills for the team player uh, mm -hmm. collaboration because that's that's really key and uh, communication skills. Yeah, it also depends uh, what level of the position it is. But if it is a student or postdoc level positions, these are the main additional things. Uh, I will I will look at them. And postdoc level, definitely, I will also look like, you know, if they have uh, writing and the communication skills in them. Ma'am, uh, we are at the very end of this session. Uh... So uh, do you have any words of advice for the students and scholars who are new to the field of plant science research? Um, yeah, I will, I will say that, you know, uh, always keep your eyes open for the new technologies, new things, always dream high, uh, mm -hmm. never be afraid of dreaming high. And then once you dream high, keep it up and then move towards that, you know. And uh, and always good to get mentor, you know who can be uh, who can be with you in your career development, because because that that's when you know you reach where you want to. And thank you so much. I think we can uh, we have collected uh, questions. Yes. Uh, related to the talk now. Yes, uh, uh, Shoma. Today I put the two uh, two three names. Uh, in a same questions because these are the similar questions so we can go on that way and names are a little bit difficult today so uh, let's see what happens okay go for that question answer. you have not arranged uh, ah, yes the... yes you, you just you uh, yes you just follow the uh, yellow highlighted question only sure uh, so uh, the first question is from uh, Sania Feroz and a young Eriv Boje. Are gene edited and transgenic different from each other? Uh, so that's a very interesting question. It, you know, gene editing, it depends upon the product. If the product has no foreign gene integration in them, then they are not transgenic. So that's the main difference because all transgenic has the foreign gene integration. But when it comes to the gene editing, some products can have the foreign gene integration, but then then particularly like SDN1, SDN2 type has no foreign gene integration in them, uh, in the final products. And those products are different from the transgenic. All right. Uh, Ma'am, next question is from um, Hasnan Sajad Pragyasantra and Again, who Mekonen. Can CRISPR Cas9 have detrimental effects from the health point of view? Um, I don't think they have any effect from the health point of view. Uh, but you also need to understand that you know when when scientists are developing the products, none of the products goes into the market without going for the extensive uh, uh, testing. So they are tested. So, you know, um, uh, if in fact you can use the CRISPR-Cas9 technology uh, in the benefit of the health, health, I will say, like, you know, uh, sometimes to increase the uh, nutritional enhancement, right? And, and also uh, minimize uh, sometimes the toxin, like, you know, uh, there are some uh, like aflatoxins, or some allergen toxins, you know, and if you know what is the causal of that thing, and then you can knock out those genes, uh, and that will be for the health benefit. I'm not aware of anything which can actually give negative impact on, on the health because uh, this is very, very targeted. Gene CRISPR-Cas9 technology is very targeted, and you actually only target the genes uh, required for your trait of your interest. So uh, Shifarao Alemu asks, who should develop the biosafety regulation in a specific country? The biosafety regulations are always developed by the regulatory agency of that country. 
uh, uh, that's that's the thumb rule you know nobody else developed that you know so like for example for for kenya is the uh, national biosafety authority nba and uh, they are the one uh, who develop the biosafety regulatory guidelines or regulations so uh, omena bernard asks for gene editing to be carried out on a crop is it required that the whole genome of the crop be fully sequenced and annotated? Um, I think it's always good that you know you have the reference genome because then it becomes the it becomes easier um, uh, when you want to identify the target. Um, but if the whole reference genome is not available, then it becomes a little bit a uh, little bit difficult. But then there are still a ways that you know, uh, particularly based on the literature, if you know that, oh, this is the gene you can you, you want to uh, target, then you can get the ortholog of that gene and then maybe get sequence that ortholog and then design the guide RNA based on that. Okay. There's another but question from you know, is uh, nowadays the, the sequencing is uh, the cost has gone down. So if you are interested in, in, in some crop you're working on is better that you get the reference genome of that crop. All right. So there's another question from the same person. How long does it take for the development of a gene edited crop from editing to a safety quality check and commercialization? It depends upon the crop uh, because you know some of the crops takes only a few months for the reg regeneration in, in comparison to the other crops. Like uh, banana is definitely long generation, but I will say average average three years. All right. Uh, is there any possibility for training young scientists in Africa who are very interested in gene editing? And is there any possibility for postdoctoral fellowships? The same question, uh, same person who asking this question. Uh, yeah, for uh, for training, I mentioned about that CRISPR course. Uh, we have uh, that course has started this year. It will run for five five different years, and uh, we have already uh, first batch of students are ongoing training. But we will have the second batch of uh, student next year, uh, and that is a competitive because I can give you example. This year we got fifty seven applications. We selected eleven. Uh, so next year there will be another call which will come sometime towards the end of this year. Look out at the IATA website. We also post on that one, and then you can you can apply uh, for the postdoc. Whenever we have the opportunities, that's an open call, and you have to apply. And that one I only talk about my lab. There are so many other labs. You know you have to also look for the the uh, job openings for the postdoc. And what would be the selection criteria for this? It's a competitive, as I said, you know, so you have to apply. And uh, and one, one criteria is based on the country uh, because, uh, okay, for the CRISPR course, this um, um, African plant breeding academic CRISPR course, that one, we are selecting the students uh, based on uh, the person needs to be on a position at some of the national uh, research institution or university of somewhere should have a position because this is not really a student. This is a training of the scientist. All and right. then the country where you are based, you should have a facility to apply this uh, training. So once you got training in CRISPR, you should have the facility to apply that one. Uh, at least the basic facility and the country should have the regulatory framework in order for you to do. Otherwise, once you train, then then what, you know, because mm -hmm. if you cannot uh, go and apply that technology. All right. So uh, AVS Durga Prasad is asking, is gene editing possible in all types of crops like self-pollinated crops and often pollinated crops? If so, what is the success rate in comparison? Uh, yes, it is possible in all different crops, uh, uh, but I cannot tell you that the success rate is very different in different crops. Uh, 
uh, is also much easier if you are working on diploid crops in comparison to polyploid crops. There are a lot of, lot of factors which can uh, determine the success rate. So, you know, I cannot say that, okay, the success rate is highest on this crop and then is, is low on this crop. Um, I, I don't know that answer. All right. But it's possible for all the crops, yeah. So, Ahodu asks, what are the limitation of Cas9 uh, genome editing methods? Uh, the most uh, limiting factor, I will say, is um, transformation regeneration. Uh, because if you want to, uh, if you want to get uh, uh, like a foreign gene free then you know most of the time you have to go through the rnp method and for that you need protoplast and regeneration and uh, and transformation of protoplast for different crops is is a little bit of a bottleneck so so i will say the most limiting factor is the tissue culture transformation all right so dr santosh kumar gupta is asking is there any training program on base editing or prime editing and how um, did you come to know about it? I'm not sure, you know, means uh, you need to look for, uh, sometimes it's the best thing is if you know the labs who are working on that one and approach those labs, you know, if they can they can provide you the, the training. Um, mm -hmm. I can only talk about the training program in my group and, mm -hmm. and not others. And then uh, we don't take, um, uh, we, our focus is Africa. Okay. So, uh, uh, Ronald, not Ronald G. Uh, Kalamba asked, does IITA accept internship graduate students? Yes, we do. So depending think, upon depending upon the availability of the funds and the projects. So I think uh, the uh, most of the questions have been answered. Relevant ones. Yes, we've and, asked all the questions. I don't think there are any more. Uh, and uh, there are two, three questions in animal. I think few people are uh, from animal background today attended it. Uh, yes, uh, the overall answer is yes. CRISPR is more famous in animal because uh, in plant we are uh, start a little bit few years late than the animals. And now each and every day the CRISPR plant are uh, in the topic, uh, like recently China also uh, approved the CRISPR uh, swab in recently two three days back. So yes, we are uh, thanks to everyone to such interactions. And really, ma'am, uh, your your to topic, everything is admire us, and I'm sure many people are admiring today and uh, i'm quite surprised many african people are so interested about iita but it's it's in uh, their reach so they are very much interesting in that way that they can reach there they can ask there and obviously a lot of scientists are working in iita and cjo institute also in different countries so it's a uh, one of the uh, good platform for plant science research worldwide and uh, ma'am, once again, thank you. And uh, as you mentioned that there is a lot of training uh, right now going on. Uh, few people are asking for, is there any study materials, initial study materials is available on that. So generally these are the training base and only giving to the training, those are trained under that. But yes, in future, if we collect something from IIT, we distribute among the uh, all if it is freely and uh, accessible to any others so yes we we take care of it and if it is yeah. possible we can go for it. and uh, yeah, i think we can we can plan that one because right now as as you very rightly said that you know our all training material goes to the students um, the one which comes and join our training program but i think online there is a lot of resources available to understand ah, uh, technology. yes yes but uh, what happened because i'm also oftenly use CRISPR in rice and now they in another crops also but uh, what happened in that the analysis is most of on based on the animal part, point of view because the initial initial softwares what they are using is the whole whole 
uh, options of genomes are most of the animals, not the plant. If there is a plant, so few. So it, it sometimes it's will be very helpful if it is designed as a plant way. So plant people can understand, okay, it is our, and here it is. Yeah, sure. <laughs> yes, and so they can ensure it. Yeah, another thing I can mention is that, you know, all the publications we are doing, they are all open access. Hmm. So anybody can, and we have a book chapter as well on, you know, how to design um, RNA, like the, like a whole, you know, how to uh, develop the RNA genome, RNA. banana plus a screening, like, you know, starting from um, our banana reference genome, how to design guide. We do have a book chapter, which is also open access. And, and then we have a, 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 a paper published in plant bio, current plant biology journal, which like a whole protocol uh, of that mm -hmm. one. So these are the resources which are available, you know, for the for the people can can tap yes. on. And uh, uh, actually, but then, then again, it all depends upon the crop you are working on, because, you know, mm -hmm. um, uh, for banana, we have the reference genome and, and even for the banana genome, that's also publicly available. There is a banana genome hub. That's the website and people can even go there and if they want to play around because, you know, not everything is at one place. We get the reference genome from there. We use another software to do the guide RNA and and mm -hmm. and other other things. Um, so so I think uh, that's and I think there is a, another uh, there are a lot of actually free uh, uh, softwares and the, even for the plants which people can use. But it all depends upon which crops they want to work on. Yes, ma'am. That is uh, one prerequisite, and um, uh, most of the questions are uh, uh, this type. We are covered all, and if there is uh, any left, uh, uh, which are easily available in in Google, actually it means uh, what is the difference between different type of technique and all. So uh, we are not uh, going to today's. Uh, we are uh, going to end this session. Uh, Thank you, ma'am. Uh, once again, once again, and maybe in the future we also come once again. Uh, I invite you once again in this uh, platform. And uh, thanks for accepting our invitations. It's a great talk. It's a uh, very interesting, and it's it will be available for everyone. And uh, um, maybe you got some connections request uh, in in that respect. If people asking for your email address, because uh, I think seven people are asking for email address, I'm not disclosing in that way, but I think it is available in your public domain or yeah, in it is. Yes. Yeah. Okay, so ma'am. Uh, yeah. Okay, Shoma. Uh, ma'am, bye. Yeah, thank so, you. Thank you very much for inviting me and thanks for all the audience. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. We hope thank to you. see you again Shoma. in the future. Yeah. Yes. Okay, bye. Okay, bye, ma'am. Shoma, please close the.